older. So they would smother. They would get into a position where they couldn't breathe and they would just die. So there's there's a that's that's a whole a whole nother interesting thing to look up is the differences between um ways to kill someone and the things that they look for when they're trying to determine that. Um, of these 75 women that were strangled and smothered, um, their bodies were dumped in vacant buildings, alleys, garbage cans, and snow banks, like I said, and the arrests have been in, made in only a third of the cases. Law enforcement officials initially shot down the idea of a serial killer. Then four more women ended up dead in the same manner. Police continued to refuse to say there was an active serial killer in Chicago, but eventually admitted it was possible. Police said there was very little evidence to connect the victims. However, the Chicago Tribune disagreed and reported what many saw as an obvious link. Most of the victims were black women. Um, I, I go back to, I think, my last podcast on the update on Brian Koberger. We were talking about what are the links between these victims and you've got to have an open mind and not have tunnel vision and be focused on one particular person. Um, it could be, you know, you could be wrong um, as, an, as a detective. So I don't know if they just didn't see that obvious link or if they saw it and didn't really want to pursue it. Um, because they didn't want there to be a serial killer. Nobody wants to say that. Nobody wants to say, hey, we have a serial killer here. Um, it's not good <laughs> for anybody, and it certainly doesn't help your community grow positively, right? Nobody wants to move to an area or start a business in an area where there's an active serial killer. It's a multifaceted thing. Um, obviously, no, they're people, they haven't found anyone yet, any one person who has been linked to, to these, um, murders and, and, and anyone that they would definitely say was the Chicago Strangler. Now there's an eastbound Strangler also on November 20th of 2006, two women were out walking when they stumbled upon four bar, four bodies discarded behind the Golden Key Motel just outside Atlantic City. The victims were women clothed and positioned face down in a line. The four women were eventually identified as Barbara Breeder, Molly Jean Ditz, Kim Raffo, and Tracy Ann Roberts. They all had been strangled, earning the killer the moniker Eastbound Strangler. Breeder had been missing for nearly a month when her body was discovered. Raffo was seen the day before she was found. At the time, law enforcement said there were no shortage of suspects. However, investigators ended up clearing each one. Near the end of 21, Chief of County Investigations Bruce Shield appealed for information on the murders. Shield said they were still working on the case. So, not much of anything after that, right? Um... But they, again, this was at the end of 21. I don't recall anything, an update of any kind. So perhaps they're dead, in jail, or have just gone dormant, right? All right, Long Island Serial Killer. You should have heard about the Long Island Serial Killer just here in the last few weeks, the last month. Um, and even at the time that this um, article was written, which was again, I think July 13th. Let me go look. 14th, July 14th. He was reporting that they did not have anyone or a suspect for the Long Island serial killings. Well, of course, we do now. And he's known um, not only as the Long Island serial killer, but the Gilgo Beach killer or the Craigslist Ripper. Um, the article said, of course, it's been 10 years since the bodies of four victims were found on a stretch of beach on Long Island's South Shore. Six more bodies would eventually be discovered. Police would later determine it was the work of a single killer. And that's where we get um, a couple different names of the Gilgo Beach Killer or the Craigslist Ripper. Um, some people at that time were pointing fingers at the Suffolk County Police Department and rumors of corruption have plagued the area because the killer's still out there. Some even suggest that the truth was suppressed by higher-ups in the police department. 
Suffolk County, Suffolk County's newest district attorney, Ray Tierney, has said that they're working to re-interview witnesses and suspects as well as re-examine evidence. Now, the update, this was published on July the 14th, but the news broke on July the 14th that 59-year-old architect Rex Hewerman of Massapequa Park, New York, had been arrested and taken into custody as a prime suspect in the Long Island serial killer case. According to sources, a DNA match linked him to the crimes. And you know what I say about that. If you've got DNA um, linking someone to a crime, pretty much, I mean, that can pretty much wrap up the case, right? Um, it's so hard to deny DNA, especially depending on where it's found. If it's found in the house on different objects, that's one thing you can argue. If it's found on the victim's body, especially if they've been raped, um, pretty hard to argue the fact that perhaps you weren't there, right? Um, so some of the stuff that we've learned just since they since since July 14th when they came out with this they've all they've started interviewing family the family members they've interviewed neighbors they're trying to find all this background information he was an architect so we know he was highly educated um if he was a practicing architect which i'm assuming he was they make pretty good money so you're not going to be probably not going to be um poverty level or lower middle class you might be upper middle or depending on, you know, maybe who he's married to, they could have a pretty high bracket and be in that upper upper class. We'll find that out, I'm sure. Um, so the Gilgo Beach serial killer case, also the Long Island killer case, has has haunted Long Island for more than a decade. It seems to have finally been solved. Last week, 59-year-old local architect Rex Hewerman was arrested and charged with murdering three women whose bodies were discovered in 2010 near Gilgo Beach along Long Island's South Shore. Hewerman lived nearby in Massapequa Park and ran his own firm in Mintown, Manhattan. Okay, this guy had money. He's also the prime suspect in the murder of a fourth woman whose body was found near the other victims. He's pleaded not guilty to the charges, of course. Below is what they have collected information on about the subject, the case against him, and any um, updates on the still developing story. So this is kind of like the Brian Koberger. It's happening right here in front of our eyes, and every single day you can pull up any major news channel or like MSN or any you know, Google, and you can find article after article after article. Now, it may be some of the same information, but then you're also going to come across a few things that are different because they maybe they talk to different people, they've used different sources. Um, I don't particularly take what I read in all of these stories to heart. I'll wait until they go to court and we see what they have evidence of. And then I'm like, this, you know, this is what happened. This is what they have proof of, or this is what they confess to. And also note that just because someone confesses to a murder doesn't mean they did it. It also doesn't mean that they're going to tell you the truth. A lot of these criminals will take credit for other people's crimes because they want to be sensationalized. Um, they want it to. They want people to know them. They want everyone to know them. There's a huge debate about these true crime shows, um, even podcasts like mine, where you, where we're talking about serial killers, and it seems like we're sensationalizing it, and it, it drives people to want to do that or continue killing, so that they can perhaps become a common household name like Dahmer or um, BTK, um, you know, the big ones. <laughs> That's certainly not my purpose. My purpose, as you know, um, is trying to figure out what it is we're doing wrong 
and what it is we're doing right as far as social emotional development in our younger children and you know creating or teaching empathy so that we avoid these situations there there's we have so much information we just have to figure out what works and what doesn't and that does require us to look at all of these cases i mean that's what i do that's what i enjoy doing so um, and it really goes right along with, you know, early childhood development, which is what I teach at the university. You know, we, if you see children that have no empathy, that have no social skills, their my mind um, immediately starts making a list of, okay, but it could be because of this, it could be because of this, it could be because of this, and I'm going to investigate that so that I can learn about that child and teach them to the best of my abilities. We've, for years, we've ignored social emotional learning or we've put it to the side, but there is really no learning that occurs without that social connection. If that student doesn't like you as a teacher, they're not going to learn from you. So a relationship, I would rather you spend six weeks at the beginning of school creating relationships and trust with your students because from then on out, they're going to learn. They're going to learn from you. You're going to know what they need. Um, there's a certain level of respect. They want to please you. Um, and that makes a huge difference. And I've experienced both. I've experienced someone who spent two, three, four weeks doing social emotional strategies. Um, and then I've also had people who just dove in the first week with whatever the curriculum said to start on. And the behavior management in each class was so very different. And the scores of the children, the grades, um, so different. They were almost always higher in the classroom that did the social emotional um, process first. So I, I changed over the years. I'm sure I've talked about it. When I first got into education, I was like, kindergarten readiness. Everybody's going to be able to write their name and they're going to know all the colors. They're going to be able to count to a hundred. I could care less about that now. Those are all valuable skills. I'm not saying that they don't have value. I'm saying that they don't matter in the very first years of school. We have to learn how to get along with people. We have to teach our children how to exist in an educational environment, a learning environment. Who are they in that learning community? What is, what is our expectations of these students? And then work with those who are having issues, those who have disabilities, those who have social emotional deficits. Those are the things that we have to get through before we can get to the academic learning. So, you know, for me, it's been a 20 odd year, 26, 20, I don't know, 29 years, maybe 28 years of observing and looking at our statistics, looking at the data that we've collected and determining, you know, I don't care if your kid can tie their shoe before they hit preschool or not. I don't care if by kindergarten they still can't tie their shoe. But I do want to know that they can get along with others. They can control their emotions. I want to advance their emotional um, levels so that they can control themselves. I mean, there's a lot to it, and it's a lot of work, but we don't stress that enough. Just lately, I'd say in the last maybe 10 years, I guess, we've really started focusing on the importance of that social-emotional health. That's why we have behavior triangles. That's why we have all these things with behavior, it all stems from social, emotional uh, issues, deficits, um, delays, um, immature emotional growth. I mean, it, there's a lot of things that go into it, but it's so very important. Um, okay, so back on Huerman. <laughs> he was arrested outside of his home, which is not unusual, but authorities took him into custody last week in Manhattan, a choice that took on new significance 
following the discovery of hundreds of firearms in his Long Island home. Hundreds of firearms. 